Well, praise the Lord, everybody. The kids are officially back to school. Every year I show these school buses just to signify that the kids are going back to school. And I caution everybody to be careful out there driving. Because what I've noticed is a lot of people cross the street and they don't look both ways. You know, they don't, uh, a lot of people that cross the street don't understand that the difference between a secure area and a soft area. When you cross in the street, it's a secure, it's a, it's a uh, soft area. When you on the sidewalk, right, it's a secure area because cars shouldn't come up on the sidewalk. But whenever you go out to, on the street to walk to everyone, young or old, remember, cross the street like the Secret Service crossed the president across the street. I'm going to say that again. When the Secret Service walk with the president and they cross a street, any street, nine times out of ten in Washington, Pennsylvania Avenue area, whatever. That is called a soft area. And as they cross the street, they be looking both ways because a car can fly up. Now on the sidewalk is more of a secure area. It was very it is very difficult to to navigate a car to get up on the sidewalk. But of course at that time, as they cross and even walking on the sidewalk, the Secret Service is looking both ways at all times. When you cross the street, whenever you cross the street, please, you look all the way until you get across because you're in a soft area. A car can come from any way. Don't say, I got the light. You may have the light, but you don't have that person that drives. So be very careful, people when you're out there crossing the street for the, for the older people and young people. And it's okay if you're on a cell phone to say, tell the person, hold on, I'm crossing the street. Put that phone in your hand. You don't have to disconnect. But as you walk across the street, you monitor each area. You watch it each area. Do not walk across the street like this here with blinders on. Okay? Then a car come hit you and you, you know, you don't see it. Okay? So please, please, please remember, when you cross the street, school is back in session. Right? School, school is back in session. But not just for school people, but the school kids, even for adults. Cross the street, please look both ways as you cross the street until you get to the sidewalk. Please. God bless you. God bless you. God lay that on my heart. Today, I'm going to start my sermon again with a prayer. Okay. The praying mind. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Church, the whole being of a person must engage in prayer. A person's life, heart, temper, and mind should be in it. Every fabric of a person should join in the prayer exercise. A person's intellect must also add energy when praying necessarily the mind plays a role in prayer. First of all, one thinks about praying. The intellect teaches us that we ought to pray by serious thinking beforehand, the mind prepares itself for approaching the throne of grace. Thought precedes entering into prayer and prepares the way. It considers what will be asked in prayer. Dear God, as I approach your throne of grace, I want to give 
all, give my all to you, body, mind, and soul. Amen. Okay? The power of prayer. Thank you. Thank you. My text today, church, is coming from Revelations chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. I know you say, well, what is Zechariah doing? What is the Reverend doing? Well, I'm reading Revelations is what I'm doing. We hardly ever hear about Revelations, which is the last book in the Bible. But today I'm reading from Revelations chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. How, oh, how I love Jesus. What we have before us is the first of seven letters written to seven different churches that exist in Asia Minor in the first century. When I preached the Revelations a few years ago, I told you that those letters could be considered from three different perspectives. One, they can be viewed uh, pro poetically. These churches represent different stages of the church over the last 2,000 years. Church, the church of Ephesians represent the time period between the day of Pentecost and 100 AD. That was a time of great expansion for the early church. It was also a time when some began to lose their zeal and uh, 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 energy. Two, they can be viewed uh, practically. These letters were sent to literate or uh, literal real congregations that was actually functioning at the close of the first century. While uh, they were written to, to real churches existence in that day, they still speak to every church in existence today. God has a word for Calvary Baptist Church in these verses. They can be viewed personally. These letters speak to congregations, but we should also be mindful that the Lord has a word for the individual in those letters as well. He has something to say to you and to me about our relationship with him. As Jesus began to write this church, he does so in growing terms, commanding them for the, commending them for their work and their doctrine purity. It appears that that this was a very busy congregation. They were uh, active with many ministries, occupying the time of the members of the congregation. In verse 2, Jesus used three words to describe the business of this church. The word works refer to their accomplishments. This was a, uh, uh, a church that had been used of the Lord to, to great things in the community. The word labor literally refers to a beat. It speaks of intense work involving toil, toil, and pain. This word patience reminds us that they carried out their works for the Lord in the midst of great persecution. The city around them hated them and the message they preached. They were, was a, uh, this was a, a working church. That's what we need today. A working church. Verse 2 and 3 and verse 6 also tells us that this church was doctrinally pure. They stood for the truth and against evil. They, practiced, they uh, publicly exposed false prophets. They were, they were what? we would call an old-fashioned fundamental church they were not allowing the world to influence their worship of their work anyone looking in from the outside 
would have concluded that they were a rock solid congregation. Anyone attending their service would have been in a week of their work and their calendar of activities. Come on now. Church, while those around them were looking at them, someone far more important had eyes on this church. The Lord Jesus Christ was walking in their midst. Verse 1, hey, hey, amen, hallelujah. But they were unaware of his presence, church. They, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, while they had much to commend them, they were, there were problems in the church of Ephesians. The Lord knew what the people around them did not know. Come on now. The Lord knew what the church itself did not know. Come on now. The Lord knew that this church was just going through the motions of serving him. He knew that they did not love him like they had once loved him. If church, if this church had been honest about their condition, their favorite hymn would have been, Oh, how I love Jesus. I want to consider the Lord's letter to this ancient congregation what he said to them then is relevant to us today. As it was in Ephesians, many in our day are merely going through the motion. Many simply do not love Jesus like they once did. It shows. I want to point out some simple facts that represent, that present themselves in this text. I want to preach on the subject of how, how I love Jesus. I want you to let the Lord speak to your heart today and ask yourself a couple of questions. Do you love him with all your heart your soul and your mind? Are you serving him because it is what you do? Or do you serve him because you are consumed with love for the Lord Jesus? Come on now. Let's focus on verse 4 and 5. Today, as I try to preach what the Lord has given me from this passage, I pray that God will speak to our hearts and help us to fall in love with Jesus again. The Lord's case against this church, after commending them for their work, Jesus condemned them for their lack of love for him. He tells them, church, that there is a real problem in their hearts. Let's notice the nature of this problem. It, it, it is a personal problem. I have somewhat against thee. The Ephesians are probably thought their biggest problems was the pagans around them and the persecutors they faced. Jesus tells them that the biggest problem they faced was a personal problem with the Lord himself. This reminds us, church, that the Lord cares about his people. If he did not have his eye on them, he would have unwaving of their problems. In verse 1, we are told that, we, that he walks among them. In verse 2, he tells them, I know. He knows us. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. No one in the church of Ephesians would ever guess what this was, what, what? Guess that there was a problem between them and Jesus. But there were, church. There were. Most of us 
would look at ourselves and think that we are all right. The problem with our way of, uh, of going our own state of righteousness is to compare ourselves with others. Of course, we never compare ourselves with anyone, anyone who lives holier than we do. We always compare ourselves with those who live less holy than we do. God's standard of holiness is a, is a bit higher than that. His standard of righteousness is Christ himself. Church, we think our biggest problems are society and government. The truth is, our biggest problem in the modern church is that, like Ephesians, we have offended a holy God. He, was, he has a problem with us because we are not where he wants us to be spiritual. It is a passion problem. Jesus tells them exactly what they have done to offer, to offend him. He tells them, thou hast left thy first love. Jesus tells them that they just don't love him like they used to. Church, while all the world, words in that phrase stream from our attention, there are two that demand special notice. They are the word left and first. The word left is an expression, an expressive word that means sin away. It was used of a husband divorcing his wife. It also means to aspire, to let alone, to omit to forsake, to abandon, to leave on places, to go to another, to disregard. Jesus is talking to a people who have walked away from their love for him. They have abandoned his love. They have forsaken his love. They have disregarded his love like a man divorcing an unwanted wife. They have symbolically sent the love, the Lord, sent the Lord away. Symbolically sent the, the Lord away. The first, the word first means first in rank of importance, church. They still love their church. They still love their doctrine. They still love their activities. They still love their busy schedules they still love uh, uh, love all they do church they just don't love Jesus more than the other things come on now how many times you seen people put things way up there notice this church we might think that falling out of love with Jesus is a minor thing we might think that it is something that happens a lot of people that is not such a big deal. That it's something we can get fixed at uh, the next revival or, uh, uh, or the next service we decide to attend. Let me show you why I think falling out of love with Jesus is a serious issue. When we, church, when we do not love Jesus as we should, we are in violation of the greatest commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 38. This opens up to a great sin. When we do not love him as we should, we are more likely to break the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make any grave images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not shall remember the Sabbath and keep 
it holy. Church, we do not love Jesus. We should, as we should. We are more likely to violate the second commandment, Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. When we are not in love with him, we will not love others like he uh, wants us to. Love is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 6 verse 22. Love for others is the work of God in our hearts. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 to 12. God got this. He's telling you right now. Church, this, this makes it far more likely that we will break the last six commandments. Honor thy father and mother. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou should not convert. When church, when we do not love Jesus as we should, we will not have a desire to be with him. Honeymoon love always want to be with the object of your affection. That's how it is for a new believer. Over time the love fades and the desire to be around Jesus and his people fades too. What is the problem? Church, it can all be traced back uh, to a loss of first love. Church, when Jesus, church, when we do not love Jesus, as we should. We will not serve him as fervently as he wants us to. We may attend church, but we will not be faithful. We might say we are saved, but we will never share the faith with the lost. We might teach a class, preach a sermon, lead a prayer meeting, lead a Bible study, but there will always be something lacking. Emotional, extravagant love for Jesus will always manifest itself in active public service for him. That church, there's much more that could be said about the dangers of not loving Jesus as we should. Many of us have been in that place where we were consumed with love for him. And many of us have been in that place where the flames of passion becomes a dying ember. We know the difference and we know which honors him the most. The Lord's call to the church. Having addressed this problem, Jesus gives them a plan of action. He tells them how they can go about uh, rekindling the flames of passion for him that once burned so brightly. Come on now. He calls on them to remember. They are commanded to remember from whence they are fallen the Lord's command is for them to look back. They needed to remember a time when their love for him was powerful, all-consuming, and the most important thing in their life. They were to remember those early days of salvation when the love of God for them was overwhelming. They were to remember how it felt to be saved and to know that all their sins have been forgiven. They were to remember, church, what it felt like to know that they were no longer dead in sin, but had been made alive in Jesus. Come on now. They, church, 
were to remember the excitement they uh, that every new revelation from the word of God brought to their hearts I say to you that we need to remember we need to remember that come on now we need to remember that moment when sin rolled away and Jesus moved in come on now don't you love the Lord we need to remember those early days of excitement and joy. And joy. We need to recapture the excitement of that early love we felt for Jesus when, when he first saved us from our sins. Do you remember? <laughs> I'm going to kind of go in my little secular little bit, but kind of hold it too. I don't call them all secular, but you know, Maurice Wright, a verse when the fire said a song, sung a song, do you remember the third the twenty-first time in September? <laughs> Michael Jackson said, Do you remember the time? <laughs> do you remember girl? <laughs> he calls on them to repent. Church. Once they remember what he had done for them they would see how far they had fallen. When they remember, they would recognize their sins. The word repent refers to a change of mind and leads to a change of action. When they saw the depths of their sin, they were to turn from it and fall in love with Jesus again. The greatest need of the modern church is for us to fall in love with Jesus once again. Before we can do this, we are going to have to recognize that our lack of love for him is a sin. We are going to have the understanding that all the things we have allowed to come between us and him are idols. Our fun, our family, our work even our church work can come between us and loving Jesus. The modern church uh, doesn't really need a revival. The modern church doesn't need more money. The modern, ch the, modern uh, the more uh, uh, recognition in society or more presence in the community. The modern church simply needs to fall in love with Jesus once more. When we repent our sin and turn from the lack of love, He will fall, He will fill us with His presence, His wonder, and His power. He calls on them to repent. He calls on them to do the first works. That word first is the same as the that as same as the word first in verse 4 it speaks of that which is first in rank and importance it in other words Jesus calls them to return to the things that are most important what is most important when it comes to our relationship with him the Lord calls here is for the Ephesian believers to return to the simple fundamentals of the faith. It is a call to return to the altar of prayer. It is a call to come back to the word of God. It is a call to return to a place of worship. It is a call to obedience to his will. It is a call for the church to walk in holiness before the Lord. Notice this church. Jesus is still, still calling the church to return to these basic fundamental foundational activities. If we do not seek him in prayer, if we do not feed him, him feed on his word, 
if we are not active in his worship, if we do not walk in holiness and obedience, then we do not love him. If we do not do these things, we cannot expect him to bless us. If we do not do things, these things, we cannot expect him to move in power among us when we gather at his house. Church. If we love, if we do these things, if we love him, he will respond to our love by manifesting himself in our lives as individuals and in the lives of our church. So, do what? So, do you want uh, to see soul saved, church? Fall in love with Jesus and let that love be seen. Church, do you want the power of God, this of the God on this church? Fall in love with Jesus and let Him live through you, through you every day. If we can recapture emotional, extravagant first love for Jesus, church, that is all we need. If we forever transform the child of God and the church of God, our problem in the modern church, our problem at Calvary, that is, is that we do not love Jesus like we should. Or we love him, but it isn't the all-consuming love that it needs to be. Oh, we love him, but there was a time when we loved him more. Church, if we were if we were to be honest, we would have to say with the Ephesians, oh how I love Jesus. The Lord's challenge to the church, to this church. Because the Lord loves his church, he lets them know that their lack of love for him holds serious, serious consequences down the road. If they stay the course and refuse to repent, they face certain judgment. The Lord described this judgment in this verse. They are challenged concerning, there are challenges concerning abrupt judgment. The Lord says that he will come quietly. The word means without delay. The Lord is telling his church when judgment comes it will be swift and sure church we can be sure that the Lord will not tolerate deadness, deadness and a lack of love among his people for an extended period of time sin will be judged of that we can be sure there are challenges they are challenged concerning appeal and judgment. He tells them that he will remove their candlestick out of his place. This means they will, uh, this means uh, that they will cease to exist as a congregation. Jesus is telling the church at Ephesians that their lack of love is so serious that it threatens the very existence of their church. This prophecy was literally fulfilled in Ephesians. From what I read, there is nothing where this great city once stood but a pile of rubble. There is no Christian church there. The land is uninhabited by other nomads. There is not Christian witnesses. There is 
no light of the gospel, all of that is the result of a church which failed to stay in love with Jesus. Look around today. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look, there are little struggling churches with a hand full of aged believers. Amen? It's not the case everywhere, but many of these churches are in their present condition because somewhere a long time ago, they stopped loving Jesus with a passionate, all-consuming love. When they did, their worship became lifeless and dead. Their preaching lost its power and its effectiveness. Their young people moved away and their church began to die. Regardless of what you might think, it can happen right here today. We are less than a generation away from this very thing taking place right here in all our churches. I pray that it won't, but I can't... Uh, be sure some of the signs already. I can see some of the signs already. You can too, if you tell the truth, church. If you will just look. That's why the Lord led me to share this message with you folks. If anybody in our church is going to repent and turn to Jesus, if anybody is going to seek him, repent, of not loving him and fall in love with Jesus again, it will most likely be those of you who care enough to come to come to come to Jesus and come to church on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They they are challenged concerning avoidable uh, judgment. I don't want Jesus to take away our candlesticks. But, church, he will if our light ceases to shine. The Ephesians are told that they can avoid their fate if they repent of their sins. The modern church is dying. She is dying because she doesn't love Jesus like she used to. The only remedy is repentance and restoration. Church, in the conclusion, it is a serious thing when a church ceases to love the Lord. that church might wander off into the abyss. And if you do, more likely that church will simply fade away and cease to exist. I heard just this week that many churches have ceased. Less members than it has uh, less members than it had. If something doesn't change, church, why is this happening? It is happening because many in our churches love their church, their doctrine, and their rituals, but they just don't love Jesus like they used to. What about you, church? If you are honest today, can you sing, oh, how I love Jesus? Or would you have to sing, oh, how I love Jesus? If he has spoken to you, you need to listen to what he is saying. Is it time for you to remember, rent, and repent. 
if we don't, there is no remedy but removal, let's remind them that we love them, that we love them. He died for us. The blood, the blood, we love him. We love him. Let's get back to praying. Church, let's get back to praying. Just ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. True prayer involves knowing beforehand what to request from God. Praying, church, is asking for something definite. The mind is giving over entirely to God, thinking of Him, of what is needed, and of what has been received in the past. The very first step in prayer is a mental step. We must be taught through our intellect. And only as far as the intellect is given over to God in prayer will we be able to learn how to pray. Lord Jesus, just like your disciples long ago, I ask of you today, teach us to pray in Jesus' name that the church say amen, amen. If this message have been uh, touch your heart, find yourself a Bible-based church and become a part of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen, amen, amen. Thank you.